Hi everybody! Welcome back to another episode of Elevate. I'm really, really excited that you tuned in today. It is a blessing to always bring you the word, the word of God that is able to build you up, to give you an inheritance among those who are being sanctified. I know the word of God changes lives and I've tasted it, I've seen it. So it's always a pleasure to know that you have tuned into the program to listen to the word of God. What a blessing it is. I'm excited to bring you the word today. We are going to pray and then we'll get started. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word changes our lives. Thank you that it is a double-edged sword piercing to the dividing of the spirit, the soul, and is the discern of our thoughts and intents. Thank you, Lord, that as we listen to your word, we'll be elevated. We'll be elevated into our destiny. We'll be elevated into our identity, into our purpose into healing, into freedom, into victory for the rest of our days. In Jesus' name, amen. Oh, wow, what a blessing it is once again to bring you the word. We've been talking over the past two episodes. I've been belaboring the point of preaching, the point of preaching. It all started with Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 4, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. And I'll just go back there. Matthew chapter 4 verse 17. Actually, I'll start at 15 where um, Jesus gets, leaves his place, his home place, gets into the region of Zebulun and Naphtali and the Bible is declaring that the people in that place were living in darkness, were walking in the shadow of death. They were not experiencing life, the life of God. And when Jesus moves into that place, the Bible says that they saw a great light. And because they saw a great light, wherever there was darkness, they now saw light. Wherever there was death, they saw life. Because Jesus moved into that place. And I started by saying that that is our expectation. That is what heaven expects of us. That when we move into places, the people who are walking in darkness can see the light. The people who are walking in, uh, in the shadow of death can experience life. The people who are walking as failures can experience victory. The people who are basically just struggling through life can experience the victory of Christ through life, can live significant, purposeful lives. lives. And so when we move into that place, that is our expectation. That is what heaven expects of us. That is what heaven expects to happen. Just like if a rich person moved into a certain neighborhood and they had a certain amount of money, when they get into that place, then... They get into that place, then um, the the neighbors expect something. Yeah, they expect that the roads will be turned up. They expect that a certain environment, their environment will change. And so that is what happens whenever, it's akin to what happens, just that it is spiritual. When a believer moves into a place, you've carried heaven into that place. You've carried life into that place. You've carried light into that place. You've carried love into that place. You've carried hope peace, joy, prosperity. Basically, you've carried the environment of heaven into that place. And that is what Jesus did. That is what, That was his experience. He carried the environment of heaven into that place. And so then, then we started answering the question, how did he carry the environment of heaven? How do you translate the environment of heaven into a place? Okay. And we were talking about... Um, We're talking about uh, the fact that when Jesus went into that place, the Bible says from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The primary way you transfer a heavenly environment into into an earthly space, a heavenly experience into an earthly environment is by preaching the word. Because the word of God is the seed of God. And once you sow the seed of God's word into a place, then you'll get the harvest, the God harvest. For you to reap a God harvest, you need to sow a God seed. And the word of God is the seed. The Bible says that the sower sows the word in Matthew 4:14, Mark 4:14. That the sower sows the word. So that's what we do when we get into places and we want to change those places to look like heaven. We don't start by building roads. It's a good thing. We don't start by building schools, hospitals. All those are good things. 
But the primary thing that needs to happen is for the word to be preached in that place. Because the word, once it is preached, once the seed of God's word is sown into an environment, then it can generate all these other things that we want. All these other things are a product of the word. And so, the greatest blessing of any person is to experience the word of God, is to receive the word of God. It is the greatest good that you and I can never do in our time. To give people something that can last forever. Something that can change lives forever. And we see it from Jesus. Okay, We see it from Jesus when he went into this land. And he saw that the people were in darkness. And he saw that the people were walking in the shadow of death. He didn't put up a concert. Concerts are good. He didn't put up a school. Schools are good. He did, but he, he started preaching the word. Let not the good rob us of the great. Because the greater good is the word of God. The greater good is establishing churches in places where the word can be preached and lives are changed for generations. And you know, there is no wisdom or counsel or understanding against God. As thing about preaching, and I remember that scripture in, uh, I think, 1 Corinthians. We are just about to find it. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. Chapter 1, I'll begin at, yeah, let me begin at verse 18, okay? He says, for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Oh, but before I finish reading this scripture, I remember saying that, um, giving the example of Lot and Jonah. I never want you to forget that example. That unrighteous Jonah saved a city by his, pre uh, unrighteous Lot, no, unrighteous Jonah, saved a city by his preaching. But righteous Lot destroyed two cities because of his good example. You'll be tempted to think that giving a good example is enough. It is not enough. In fact, it is far from enough because the world doesn't need examples. The world needs the potent power in the seed of the word of God that is preached, that can change lives. That's what the world needs. Yeah. Now think about Jesus preaching what wisdom is that? That the Son of God who wants to change the world can come and all he's doing is teaching in the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing. How come that is all he did? Why didn't he run for political office? Why didn't he start a business? Why did he say, I'm going to build the church? Why didn't he build a university and begin certifying people and giving them degrees? If that is truly the thing that changes the world, why didn't he dig boreholes for people? Why didn't he look for orphans and set up an orphanage? Why is it that when the Son of Man came, Okay. Even in his manifesto in Luke 4, 18, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And the first thing he says is to preach the gospel to the poor. Why is it that way? Why is it that the world makes it seem like preachers are the worst thing that ever happened to, to a society? And yet Jesus, the best thing that happened to mankind, the best person that happened to mankind was a preacher. So, so why does the world seem to paint preachers as some irrelevant, useless, um, I don't know, noisemakers somewhere? And, and that thing has somehow entered believers to think that the worst thing you can do is to be a preacher. No, actually the best thing you can do with your life is to preach the gospel. It is the best thing because it's the only thing that can change a heart of a man for eternity. It's the only thing that can bring light into darkness because the Bible says that your word is a light, a lamp unto my path, a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. Psalm 119 verse 105. It is preaching, preaching, preaching. That's what Jesus did. Can you imagine they sent him from heaven to come and preach? To preach. That is why he came from heaven. To preach to us. To reveal the word of God to us. And so I was thinking about preaching. I've been meditating on preaching lately. And 
And he says that for the message, in 1 Corinthians 1.18, he says for the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The message of the cross that is preached, it is like foolishness. When you sit down and you are hearing the word, it sounds foolish, but it is the power of God. The power of God is in the message of the cross. Yes, it is in the message of Jesus, the gospel, that God would send his only begotten son to die on the cross. That is the power of God. He says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the, proven, of the prudent. And he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? You know, this world has wisdom. Probably, probably when Jesus came, people thought that he would do something. The disciples thought that he would become a Roman king or something. He would become a king or he would be, be like Caesar or something to save them from Roman oppression. Hmm? He says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. You see, the wisdom of, God, of the world never got people to know God. You see, we have, we have, and I'm not against, again, I need you to understand my heart. I'm not against all these good things that we do know. But they cannot be elevated or exalted above the preaching of the word. Okay? We have so many NGOs. But I can tell you, NGOs can never truly change the world. Yeah. That one, you, they can never truly change the world. If they did, then Jesus would have set up an NGO. Mm. Yeah. It may not be a popular message, but that's the truth. He would have set up and why didn't he do it? If, if the purpose of it is to just do social good, but not to transform people's lives by preaching the gospel to them, then I can tell you that there is something, there is an ingredient missing. They are doing good and they should continue doing good because we need them for the social work. But the greatest good you can ever do for any person is to preach the gospel to them, to expose them to the preaching of the message. He says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. This is what it says. He says, this is the part I wanted. He says, it pleased God. This is what pleased God. When God thought about it, he was elated. He was excited. He was overjoyed. The Bible says it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached. To save those who believe. Through the foolishness of the message. Not the message lived out. But the message preached, 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 preached. Words. The, it says, it, like God was excited. And he said, you know what? This is how I'm going to save mankind. This is how I'm going to give mankind opportunity to live a God life. This is how I'm going to get a natural man to have a supernatural experience. This is how I am going to get a sorrowful man to live joyfully. This is how I'm going to get a dead person to have life. This is how I'm going to get a broke person to become rich. This is how I am going to get an unfaithful person to become faithful. This is how I'm going to get a purposeless person to become purposeful in life. An insignificant person to become significant. This is how I'm going to do it. He says it pleased God. When he thought about it, it was the best idea in the world. According to God. Yeah, best idea in the world. It says it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. A message preached to save those who believe. It is through the message preached that we can receive salvation. I gave you the statistic that over we are over now, eight, we are 8 billion people on this planet. But more than 6.5 or so billion people don't know God. They have no relationship with Jesus. Look, no NGO is going to solve that. No government is going to do that. They are not thinking about it. It is you and I, the believers, the church, we are the hope of the world. That's why Jesus says, I will build my 
church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will build my church. That's the thing Jesus is building. That's the thing he's investing. His time, his resources, his wisdom, his strength. It is to build the church. And so I can tell you, my dear friends, that it is the building of the church because the church then becomes the entity where the gospel will be preached forever and ever and ever. And look, this thing is not just for a few people. Like I told you, it is for all of us. You are called to preach. Don't wait for another call. The call has already gone out. Maybe you had not heard. Now you're hearing. You're called to preach. That is how the world is going to be changed. That is how I was saved from committing suicide. When a young man called Remus Mark, when I was 14, came and preached the gospel to me. It is through the preaching of the message. He says here, through wisdom they did not know God, but it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. And he says, because in verse 25, he says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. In case you're doubting, the scripture is right here. Foolishness. Hmm? Yeah, it is wiser wiser. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. And so in his wisdom, he has decided, you know what? Preaching. Let's talk about what happened when the Holy Spirit came in the book of Acts chapter 1. In the book of Acts chapter 1. Actually, no, let's do chapter 2. In the book of Acts chapter 2, one of the greatest events in human history when the Holy Spirit came down as Jesus had promised in Acts 1.8, because he told them they will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come down and there will be witnesses to him in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And so he says here that in Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were in one accord. They were all with one accord in one place. What happens is that the Holy Spirit comes upon them and they are filled with the Holy Spirit and they begin praying in tongues. When they begin praying in tongues, the first, the first work that the church did after they started praying in tongues when the Holy Spirit came was not to start a conference over for what? Was not to construct a borehole, was not to do a school, was not to start a business, was not to form a political party, was not to run for political office. It was not... Uh, to, I don't know, whatever it is that we seem to elevate above preaching in the world. The Bible says that Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to him, men of Judea, Peter started preaching. Like it's the natural flow that when the Holy Spirit came, that the response for Peter, it's like for a person who is truly filled by the Holy Spirit, their automatic response to this is to preach. And it's evident in the Bible. When Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit after he was tempted, first assignment, preaching. The disciples, their first assignment, preaching. Paul, when he encountered God, before you know it, he was busy with fellow Jews, teach, showing them that Jesus is the Christ, the anointed one. It's like any man who is truly filled with the Holy Spirit, they know the value and purpose of preaching. Evangelism. So this is what happened with Peter. He stood up immediately and started preaching. He didn't write a chemical equation. He didn't write the y, dx. He didn't, nothing. The thing that happened instantly was for him to begin preaching. And as he was preaching, 3,000 people received Christ on that day. 3,000. 3,000 people received Jesus as he was teaching on that day. Why? Because he took on the foolishness of the message and he preached. He preached to the level that 3,000 people gave their lives to Jesus. Look, when the Holy Spirit truly comes into your life, eh, your first thing is going to be preaching. You're going to just begin preaching. Yeah, and that is what we are called to do. That's why I told you that the purpose of fueling a car is not for you to keep it, it's for you to drive it. So the purpose of being filled with the Holy Spirit is not for us to go about over doing whatever it is that we are doing. No, it is for us to go out and saturate the world with the word. 
It is time to saturate the world with the word. Now is the time. We are in the right generation where we need saturation, saturation, saturation. You get into a town and you camp there and you preach every day on social media, on the street. You recruit people, preach, preach, preach until that place is saturated with the word of God. Because when it is saturated with the word of God, then you're going to start seeing the God fruit in that place. Now is the time. It's not tomorrow. Now is the time for you to rise up and begin preaching. Begin preaching. Begin teaching. Do something about it. Don't be, don't stay dormant. The anointing is for us to preach. The gift of the Holy Spirit is for us to be witnesses. Witnesses to Christ. To witness to the power of the gospel. And you say, I don't have much revelation. What? Start with what you have. Be faithful with the little that you have. The first time I did evangelism, I knew only one scripture, maybe two. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then Romans 10. There are two scriptures I knew. And there are the two scriptures I used to preach. And people got saved. And you see, what, when you're faithful with the little, God entrusts you with more. As preachers, our call is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So then, so then the saints, because you're a saint, you need to be equipped for the work of the ministry. What is the work of the ministry? It is preaching the word and supplying the spirit. It is serving bread, serving wine. That is ministry, serving bread, serving wine. We we'll give ourselves continually to the to prayer and the ministry of the word. That's what Jesus did. Went about teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing. So, friends, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. I want it to be in your system. Don't, don't let this generation die without hearing your voice as a preacher. Don't leave your your generation without hearing, without us hearing your voice as a preacher. Saturate your, the world with the word of God. It is the life. Don't fall for the lie of the world. They think where the world thinks that preaching is the worst thing anyone can do. No, it is the best thing anyone can do. It's it's more it's a more noble profession than being a medic, than being a lawyer. Oh yes, than being the president of a country. Yes, it is more noble to be a preacher. Of the gospel. More noble. Because your work is going to stay for eternity. And you're going to save millions of people. You can do all those things. But they should be the means to an end for you to become a preacher. In your office, preach. In your business, preach. In your car, preach. In your school, preach. Start it for the purpose of preaching. To aid the gospel. To aid the gospel. To plant many, many, many churches where people will hear the word of God and their lives will be changed forever. And so my friends, I could go on and on and on and on about preaching. I'd like you, to, I want to challenge you, do something, do something, have a target. My target this year is to win 1,000 souls to Jesus. I'm well on my way, directly, me, 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 1,000. I so far have about maybe 500 and maybe 67. And I'm going for it. I want to encourage you to go for it. Because God loves you. God wants the world to know. He wants the, the world to be reconciled to him. Amen. And so if you're listening in again, I want to encourage you, shine your light. The more of the word you give, the more of the light you shine. The more word, the more light. The more word, the more light. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I know you're going to do something about it. And I'll be excited to join you again next week for another episode of Elevate. We are still in Matthew chapter 4. Um, we just ended up talking a bit about preaching because that's what Jesus did. And I believe God is calling you to be a preacher. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, now is the time. Today is the day. I'd like to give you the opportunity to do so. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Today I give my life to you. I believe that you're the son of God. I believe that you are raised from the dead. And I declare today that I am born again. Take my life. 
fill me with the Holy Spirit and do something significant in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer, you're born again. Welcome to the family of God. I'm really excited for you. Please contact us on that number. We would like to walk this journey with you and pray with you. But also, I would like to pray for particular people. You feel the call to become a preacher, to actually to plant a church and to pray for you. Father, thank you for my brothers who are watching. I know where they are, you see them. They want to go and start churches and plant churches. Anoint them. May this fire burn in their hearts for the rest of their days. That like Paul, they will say, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. And Lord, may they receive that anointing and that grace to plant churches. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, you want to plant a church as well, contact me on that number. I'd like to help you. I'd like to walk the journey with you because you're doing the most significant thing in the world. Preaching. God bless you so much. Share this video with someone. See you again next Tuesday. You are loved. You are so loved. God bless you. Bye-bye.